for being with us. We have an excellent program today. A couple of quick announcements, if I may. Our treasurer, Kenley Wade, who was sitting right there. <laughs> Kenley Wade, who was sitting right there, will take your dues if you're so inclined today. Uh, maybe he'll wave when he comes back in. I don't know. Uh, I, uh, I'm sorry to give a little dues pitch in the, uh, in the comments this week, but uh, uh, like all organizations, uh, uh, we need at least a little bit of uh, cash flow. A um, couple of announcements. Program next month is on the Lincoln Heritage Water Trail, the Sangamon River. I think uh, either 40 years or 50 years ago, uh, Governor Kerner uh, uh, formally made that the uh, Heritage Trail. The uh, DNR uh, and, and uh, Lewis uh, Hockey is with us this morning. He'll be the program next week, next month. Uh, but it's going to be an exceptionally good program on uh, some ideas on the river between Decatur and Petersburg. The program in December, December 19th, uh, the SIU School of Medicine, Sangamon County Department of Public Health, Memorial Hospital, St. John's Hospital have collaborated to do some needs assessment. Um, and uh, this will be a program on where they're at on that collaboration. And again, I think will be an excellent uh, program. Uh, program this morning is actually on CWLP. Uh, just a couple of quick comments that uh, Eric might use and might not use. Um, in 1911, we adopted a commission form of government because the old aldermatic form was too corrupt. Uh, but out of that, Willis Spaulding became the commissioner of uh, I don't think it was called Public Works, but in essence, the, the top dog. In 1914, a referendum to create basically what is today CWLP was, uh, was passed by the, in referendum by the citizens of Springfield. It's interesting, though, that was the first time women were allowed to vote uh, for, the issue, for an issue like that, I guess for anything at, at that time. Their Illinois Register quotes, it was not expected even by advocates of the plan that the women would show much civic interest. Uh, exhibiting quite as much intelligence, if not more, than the men. The, the point is they counted the vote separately and the men defeated it and the women overwhelmingly voted it in. So if it wasn't for the women in 1914, it might not be a CWLP, so you might keep that in mind. CWLP is one of about 40 municipal utilities in Illinois. It is the only one that has uh, its own coal-fired turbine um, generating machines. Eric Hobby is a chief utility en engineer since 2009, started with CWLP in 1993. Eric, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And I will turn the program over to Mr. Eric Hobby. Actually, that is, you know, when you look at history of CWLP, and there's some of this in there, I mean, when you go back and look at that, and we have done that recently with a 100-year look back, we have some amazing history. I mean, it absolutely is amazing. We, we went to the Supreme Court. We're recognized by the American Public Power Association for the, for the foundation of public power across this country. So when you, we'll go through that and we'll talk about that a little bit. So, you know, being an engineer by background and a business person, open and honest discussion, I want to do that. You know, we want to make sure we have that talk today because I'm not doing anything other than trying to present the facts. You know, there was some information that went out and kind of talked about questionable decisions of the past. You know, that's more opinion, and I can't change history. None of us can. So I don't look backwards on that. I'm trying to look forward. You know, utility board concept, 
That was never mentioned to me as a topic for today, so that's not where I'm geared around. We're going through and talking about our current financial situation and our options as we move forward. And, you know, CWLP fired a bank, corrupt the city. I don't know what to say about that, but other than kind of inflammatory. The CWLP provides about $11 million in value every year to the corporate fund, which is about 10% of the corporate fund budget, either in direct cash payments or services through street lights, traffic lights, computer services that every other city pays for. So, you know, I don't consider us bankrupting the city. We actually reduce the operating cost of this city. So, you know, moving on to what are we going to talk about today? Well, what's the value of public power? You know, why do we have a municipal utility? You know, current financial situation is kind of the hot topic. You know, a little bit of how did we get here? You know, and where do we go? What are, what are the options? You know, and then we'll talk a little bit about the history. And then I think there's a relevant comparison to kind of sum it all up. Local ownership and control. You know, I think that's a big part of, of being public power. When you look at this, your municipal utility benefits our community. CWP has over a billion dollars worth of assets. That's right, it's over a billion. Bob Brosh is at Ministry of Services and he gets to do the insurance policies now. And you know, I think that's a shocking number the first time you walk in and you see that. And anybody that's ever had the opportunity to take a tour out at the uh, generating facilities and the water plant, most people have no idea how big of place that is until you go there. You know, when people think of what's the largest industry in town? Nobody says CWLP. Once you go out there and you look at it, you realize we're the largest industry in town. It gives us local control over rates, our investments. You know, where do we want to go? What's important to our community? It's not being decided in St. Louis. It's not being decided in Chicago, where the investor-owned headquarters are. It's being decided right here in this community. The pilot payment, payment in lieu of taxes. This year it's going to be six to seven million dollars that pay to the corporate fund. That's additional services or reduced taxes. Again, I mentioned traffic lights, street lights. We have electricians. We do that for the city. Our IBW members do that. There's no charge to the city for that. They don't pay for the energy. Every other city does. Computer services provided by CWLP. All of our technical guys do that for, for the city. Our jobs represent about $57 million of income to people that live in this community. If you don't have CWLP, that's paying people that don't live in this community. There's over 600 in-house jobs. That's, you know, you can argue this all day long with economic multipliers. Does one job equate, affect one and a half, two, three? There's all kinds of different metrics. It impacts thousands of jobs directly and indirectly in this community. Um, you know, the Viper Mine by itself employs over 300 people. You know, we, we use local people as much as possible. Reliable. If you look at our outage rates, we have half the number of outages. They last a third as long as our neighboring investor owns. We, our guys have tremendous pride. When our linemen go out and work out out of town, we get compliments from other utilities, the investor owns, the other municipals, about their skill set and their work effort. That happens every time we go out of town. Affordable. Everybody's, uh, the big focus is on rates and there's lots of ways to spend rates because now with deregulation, there's unbundling of rates. The bills have got a lot more complicated. Anybody tries to look at the, their old phone bills and how many different line items, that's what most utility bills have gone to. We still have a customer charge and energy charge. That's it. But when you add those together and compare us on a national average, we're still below the national average. We're still a good value compared to the rest of this country. You know, kind of talking a little bit more about our current financial situation. This is from the presentation Tuesday night. Basically, it's the summary of the financial condition. Electric fund cash is negative. What do we mean by that? Well, we have some money in the bank, but what we have borrowed short term is greater than the money we have. 
We have actually paid off our line of credit, but the electric division owes the water division, uh, it's on here I believe, $6.7 million. Well, it's just CWLP. How, what do you mean they, they owe each other money? They are legally separate and distinct financial entities. The revenues of the electric system pay for all the electric. The revenues of the water system pay for all the water. Just like the corporate funds a completely separate entity. We have people that have split salaries, but they charge to each area. So they're funded independently. Electric pays for water. Electric is the biggest user of water. Water pays for electric. They're the biggest user of electric because, again, we're the largest industry in town. So when you look at this, the big talk about is the last part and the, and the top part in the red is the projected year-end debt coverage is 1.01. What's that mean? Well, our requirement is 1.25. And that's a requirement of our, basically, our master bond ordinance, which is our agreement with people that loaned us $600 million. And what they're saying is, you have to have a number of one means, after we pay our operating expenses, we have just enough cash only to pay the debt surface, and not a penny more. That 101 means we have 1% more than that. What 1.25 means we have 25% more than that. Well, why is that in the loan document? Well, is it just extra money going in a bank account, setting aside, as some people have said? No. That, what that represents is the ability for us to reinvest in our system to keep it operating for the next 30 years. Because these bonds are 30-year bonds. This isn't a home loan where they have the lien on our assets. The only thing the bondholders have is access to our revenue. And if our revenue stream is not enough to pay them, they, they can't come after our power plant. They can't come after our, our transmission or distribution system. We've agreed to create enough revenue to be able to pay them. That's our agreement with these people. And we're violating it. And we'll be violating it for the second time in four years this year. And, you know, people that loan us $600 million are kind of important. The, the bank that has your loan on your house, they're kind of important to you. So, you know, I, we don't want to disrespect them and break our agreements. Um, down there, the water fund, it's in very healthy financial position. You know, it's got 120 days cash. So when you talk up there in the top part about $33.9 million, that's 60 days of cash. I think if you go talk to a lot of financial advisors, they tell you as an individual, you ought to have two months of cash set aside. Business is no different because income goes up and down and you should have that. Well, $33 million sounds like a huge amount of money. Our annual budget's over $220 million. That's just, you know, be able to make our payments, pay our bills, pay our payroll. You know, that's just a normal operating metric. You know, electric fund concerns. This is from our June presentation. Um, as soon as we started seeing where we're going this, this year, we let the city council know. We give one of these every month since our last time we came up and talked about a rate increase. The reason we do this every month, last time we came up and asked for a rate increase, there was a little bit of kind of shock and awe. Nobody had any idea. So since then, we've been doing monthly financial presentations so that everybody knows. If you watch uh, the, the second city council meeting every month, we're doing a financial presentation. And we're talking about where we're at. Big problem this summer is that summer never happened. You know, I was out at uh, UIS watching my daughter's softball game on the 4th of July weekend, and people were wearing coats. <laughs> I'd never seen that before. So, you know, when you look at this chart, the farthest left column is what we actually saw for July sales in town. Um, you know, coming through summer, we're about $7.5 million short on revenue. You know, that was the big thing that hit us this year. You know, when you look at the debt coverage, why are we saying we're going to be in default? The last time we went in default was FY12. Through July, the debt coverage at that point was 0.98. This year was 0.94. Um, the below average finances continued through August. You know, and it's either ex revenue or expense cuts. We need about $10 million to be able to make that up from 101 to 125. You know, current projected coverage is 101. This would be the second technical default. That would put us 
if we get downgraded, and we will, we'll be in a B bond rating, lowest in history of CWLP. We're basically, if you get two downgrades, we're in junk bond status. What's that mean? Higher borrowing cost. Also, anybody in this town buy any of our bonds? You just lost value if you want to sell them because the downgrades lowers the value of our bonds in the secondary market. So if you're out trying to trade them, you just lost money if you invested in us. How did we get here? Well, first of all, where we're at today isn't a surprise. And how do we get here over the longer term? It's nearly a perfect storm of events. And this is from a, a statement that the mayor issued March 1st, 2012, right after the last budget passed with a rate increase. And it talks about offering a word of caution. It says, I'm afraid the general public thinks that we've passed a rate increase that has fixed the financial problems. It continues on, but we anticipate being out of compliance with debt service coverage for the fiscal year ending February 28th, 2015. That's the one we're talking about right now. It was predicted. We ran the financial models, and we said, this is where we're going. We asked for a single-digit rate increase last time. We got half of it. You know, we asked for the minimum. You know, a lot of people have said, well, you, you don't have a, you know, the utilities, the investor owns have to go before the Illinois Commerce Commission. You don't have anything like that. Well, I do have a board, and I have to sell, and they're pretty tough to get anything through. If I had to go to the Illinois Commerce Commission and make a business case, I'm very happy to do that because I've got a very sound business case to make we, when we look at what we've done. You know, and this was a statement that went out. It wasn't a secret. It was printed in the media. It was covered very well. There was a press conference held. So anybody that acts like this is a surprise, it was predicted two years ago. Well, unless a rate increase or significant cut in expenses, that's the only way we're going to avoid this default. Here's what's gone on. Since 2012, we've continued to cut headcount. If you look, this is a 20-year look back at our headcount. We have been historically right at 700 is about our low point. Today, we're at 605. The dark blue bar is just there for my own reference. That's when I started this job. Not that I take credit for all the downsizing, but uh, anybody know when the recession hit? Spring of nine, I started in May of nine. It's been a fun ride, so. <laughs> so if, as you look at it today, we're at about 605 employees. We've cut nearly 140 actual people. That's nearly 20% of the workforce. Nobody in the history of the city has done that. We have delayed outages. We have canceled capital projects. Right now, the depreciation on our system is four times the rate of our capital investments. What's that mean? Our products are, re our, our facilities are reaching the end of their useful life at four times the rate we're putting new ones up. We're living off the aging system right now. So when you talk about doing cuts, also, everybody says, you got to cut more, you got to cut more. Our head chemist who does our pollution controls at the plant is retiring. I have no replacement. I have other people that are looking at leaving. I have no replacements. We're at dangerous levels of staffing as we set today. We cannot continue to cut staffing. And when you look at this historically, we've never been here before. How do we get here in a little longer term perspective? This is a slide that was from our original presentation that we did about the rate increase. You know, this is looking back in history. There was an assumed $35 million state grant. I wasn't part of that. Don't know what happened, but we didn't get it. Dahlman won. We spent about $5 million doing turbine work. Dahlman three scrubber upgrade. We had one of the first scrubbers in the country in 1980 to remove SL2. We upgraded it at a cost of about $30 million, and now it's state of the art. That $15 million, we had to borrow additional cost of issuance and reserves. That's another $58 million of debt that we issued that rates were not raised for back in 2006 timeframe. 
and this last debt was issued in around 2008. That's $4 million of debt payments annually. If you put coverage on there at 1.5, which is kind of the minimum you target, that'd be $6 million. That'd be 50% more. Well, it's easy to sit here and say, those people should have asked for a rate increase. Why'd they go borrow that money without asking for a rate increase? Well, let's look at the situation back then. Power prices were nearly $70 a megawatt hour in the wholesale market. We sell about a million megawatt hours outside the city. Prices now are down about 35 to 40. That's $30 million additional revenue if prices were still around $70 a megawatt hour that we would have coming into our system. So you need $6 million a year, but you're going to have $30 million in revenue. Anybody think that would be a good time to ask for a rate increase when that was the financial information available to those people? Now maybe the easy thing for me to do is just to blame them and say they should have got it and that's the problem that I have today. I'm an engineer and I'm an MBA and I look at business case stuff and I go, that would have been impossible to sell. You look at the history going backwards, guess what happened right after August of 8 when that last red bar was issued? That's when the economy collapsed, the fall of 8, spring of 9. And anybody that knew that was going to happen, I hope you own your island in the Caribbean because you made your investments to, to recognize this collapse because nobody else knew it. These, these prices represented forward selling prices. Nobody in the market knew there was going to be a collapse. If, they, if people suspected that, prices would have been going down. This represents forward energy prices. What else has happened? You look at our native load. It's always increased. And then it started flattening out. Well, it started flattening out about the same time the states started moving out of town. We've lost over 40 state accounts. It's about 15%. Um, economic growth in here. I think if there's anybody from the Home Builders Association, our number of home starts were almost in single digits you know, compared to, to neighboring communities. So, you know, there's a lot of people say, well, we should have known this is all about uh, um, energy efficiency. Well, our growth has always been about half on the energy side of what growth in the community has been. There's always been a component of energy efficiency. The refrigerators of 1960 were not as efficient as the refrigerators of 1980, weren't as efficient as the ones in 2000. There's always been a component of energy efficiency, and that's always been recognized. Same thing on the water side. Water demand does not grow as fast as what the population grows. So we, we knew that. This is recession and a lot of state, you know, moving out. There's, there's been a lot a loss, like I said, 40 state accounts have gone away. That's our biggest source of revenue, is our sales in Springfield. Our cost, cost of copper, cost of transformers, cost of other material has not gone down or flattened out. They continue to go up, but our main revenue source has flattened out and may even gone down. The other option is selling power outside the city. This is a historical look back. Again, see the avalanche of prices. This is a 12 month looking forward at any point in time. What the next 12 months of power sell for. Well, again, it crashed from the fall of eight to spring of nine. You see a little spike up this past winter with the polar vortex. You know, this is all happening prior to 20 to 70,000 megawatts of coal plants that are going to shut down somewhere across this country. You can read reports, there's all kinds that are going to close down. Why are they going to close down? Because they have not installed the pollution control systems that we have on our, all of our units. And this price, where the market at, does not pay for the hundreds of millions of dollars of investments. Where these prices are at today, they cover variable cost of operation. They do not cover the fixed cost of operation of these plants. They don't pay for any debt service to do any investments. These are not sustainable prices. They will go back up. And we have to decide as a community, do we want to be, when all those high prices were there, did our citizens have any pain for that? Nope. We were shielded from it. Lots of other communities, people were screaming. This is when everybody was asking for deregulation because prices were surging. Our community was isolated from it. 
The question is, do we want to continue to have a history of protecting ourselves, controlling our own destiny, or let the markets drive our prices? Does anybody know, does Ameren care what your energy price is today? Ameren does not sell electricity. They deliver it. You buy your energy from a third party. Ameren, let me repeat that, Ameren does not make electricity today. You buy it from a third party on the open market. And those people are selling you right now one or two year contracts because anybody can sell you a price out there beyond 10 years is selling you something that won't exist. There's been, I've seen a few people that have offered, there's more get out of jail free cards clauses in there than anything because they're saying if the plant closes, the contract's no good. If the EPA changes rules, the, the contract's no good. You can't get energy sales longer than that. So where do we go? Well, status quo is kind of where we're at right now. But the decision to do nothing is a decision unto itself, and it has consequences. We're going to have our technical, technical default in four years. We're going to have a rating downgrade, and we're going to have a very poor budget for next year. We're likely going to have borrowings in next year's budget, and borrowings are not revenue, and we'll likely have a budget that will be in default for the third time in five years, as budgeted. Option two, we offered some rate and pilot restructuring ideas. You know, we did this because we said we're going to go into default. We got asked by some aldermen saying, what are the options? What can we look at? What we looked at is industry trends. How many people in here know we offered a lower energy rate? Let's see, one, two hands, three. Anybody ever heard in the media we offered lower energy rates? We did, because the industry has lower energy. We suggested raising the customer charge, because that's what the energy. Most people's customer charges are three to six times higher than ours. What's that do? It desensitizes us and the customer to weather. This summer, when we lost $8 million in revenue because all of our income is based on kilowatt hour sales, it went way down. So we want to lower that price and raise the fixed part what happened this last winter? If you're an all-electric customer heating your house last winter on electric, you saw big increases in your bill. We want to lower that so you don't see those big spikes in the winter, and we want to raise the fixed charge so your monthly bill levels out, income levels out. And that's what we proposed. We also proposed the pilot, payment in lieu of taxes. It's right there. It says tax. Basically, right Every, every time we collect a bill, 2.67% of it immediately comes out of us and goes right to the corporate fund. So our, our rates have an embedded 2.67% tax that goes to the corporate fund. <coughs> Guess who are the only people in Springfield that pay that? CWLP Electric customers. We have Ameren Gas that uses energy. We have Ameren Electric some. And they don't pay that. Most municipals have a tax on energy. Rochester has a 5%. Southern View, we collect 5% for them on top of our bill and give it to the city of Southern, or village of Southern View. Ours is embedded in our rates. So we suggest to take it out of our rates, put it on there, let Ameren gas customers pay, and Ameren electric customers, not just charge our own customers. That's the idea of what we wanted to restructure. We have a whole source of revenue out there on the gas customers that most, when cities apply a municipal utility tax, the gas people get charged too. If you're an all-electric customer, you're paying more value to the corporate fund than the people that are paying using gas to heat their houses. We're punitive to our own customers. We suggested changing that. Consequences. We'd avoid a default for 16. Lowering the energy cost. Businesses are large energy users. It makes it more attractive for businesses makes it more attractive for businesses to expand because it lowers their operating costs as they go forward. Their fixed portion of their bill is very small. You know, there were some media stories that talked about, interviewed some businesses about our last proposal and people said, we can't afford anything. I looked at one of those customers, they would not pay more under our proposal. But trying to get the truth out versus kind of the reactionary 
oh my gosh type of reaction is sometimes hard to do. And raising something this year and restructuring to will help mitigate the downgrade next year because the braiding agents will say, yeah, you had a default, but you've done something about it. Doing nothing about it when they review next year and we're just sitting there, um, there's a chance of a double downgrade. Option three, the one I don't really want to talk about, but it's been talked about on the radio, let's just sell the place. Time to get out of the business. 500 jobs would be lost. Thousands of others in this community. I wasn't here, but my dad actually, out of college, one of his first jobs was at Fiat Alice. He actually ended up working for the uh, CIPS power plant in Coffeen, and I grew up in Hillsboro. But, you know, I, I heard enough growing up about what Fiat Alice did to Springfield. This would be a Fiat Alice disaster to our economy. The $57 million in salary that we pay doesn't stay in this town. Our power plants will close. Ameren sold all of their power plants for basically no money. Dynegy bought it for their $800 million in debt and gave Ameren no cash. They took their debt. I think it was about 4,000 megawatts for 800 million. We have 600 million in debt and we've got about 400 megawatts. Anybody going to pay for that? These are small plants too, relatively speaking. Right now, when energy markets are at their lowest, anybody want to buy plants? It's not a good time to buy. So the best people will buy is all of our customers. And again, as I said before, does Ameren care what our electric bill is? They just, they collect money on the wires. They don't make any money in energy. If energy doubles, triples, it's not their problem. Also, $11 million to the corporate fund. Again, I talked about that value. That's about 10% of their budget. You're going to cut services. You're going to raise taxes on that side. You know, you want to talk about something that's going to be disastrous to the community, that would be one of them. A little bit of history, and I'll try to go through here real quick. This is one of the most controversial parts we have. And guess what, folks? We can't change any of it. I can't change history. We built a power plant, and we did a deal. A lot of people hate this deal. It allowed a plant to be built. One of the key parts about this is Dolman 4 could not be built today. The new rules by the EPA you cannot build this plant. So no plant ever again in the United States will be built that can produce power as low cost as this. And it's one of the cleanest plants going in the country. You can't build it. So you think it was a good idea to get it built? The, our options were you fight the group that was protesting it in court and our vendors said if you do that you're going to lose your bid because it expired. Anybody know how many bidders we had on this plant? One. We had one bidder. Why? Because other plants were being built and this was a small one. Well, if you can build a 200 megawatt plant or I get to bid on a 1600 megawatt plant, if you're a company, I want 30% on 400 million or I want 30% on a billion dollar plant. Which one are you going to use your uh, assembly line to build? Well, if you want to sell it, maybe we'll mark it up 80% on your 200 million so I make as much money as I do 30% on a billion. And that's what the people were telling us. If you want to get back in the queue after you go through court and you likely prevail, you're not going to pay a 30% mark or, you know, advantage. You're going to pay 80, 90, 100%. Prices are going to go. And this is not a knock on Prairie State. But if anybody knows about Prairie State, it was built after us. That plant doubled in cost. And what that shows is our people made a decision that recognized prices were going up. And Prairie State's cost proves that. It doubled in price. What do we get out of this? We have 20% renewables. If you look at us today with the proposed EPA rule, 
We, we already have a 30% reduction, very close to that, on our customers today. That's what the target is. We may meet that already without doing anything. So we're in a very good position as we look forward. This is the part I like. Spalding talked about in the beginning the things he did. I think one of the key parts about this is, you know, he got the electric and water going. He made deals. He got the plants going. He was a businessman. He knew what it take, took to run a business. The council rejected building a plant. He went out and took a referendum out, and it got passed. And as Bob pointed out, thank the ladies. You know, that's a great piece of history. He went out and did this. He had a lot of fortitude, leadership, vision to do this. He had to raise privately about $2 million today to put the first generator in. Went in 1915. Immediately began looking at the next plant. Put this up there because there's some people who say, we are the only municipal in Illinois that generates electricity. LA does, Seattle does, Jacksonville, Florida does. Uh, there's, there's lots of them around the country that do. And there's some people in here from IMEA. They procure power and own parts of plants to do that for other municipals because they're smaller. We have a hundred year history of operating power plants. This isn't something foreign to us. We've been building and doing power plants. If you look through that, up to where Dalman 3 was built in 78, what our plant guys say, we were in a constant state of construction basically from 1916 through the 1970s. We finally built a plant a little bit bigger and had some forward vision to say we don't have to build a new plant every three years or four years. And that's what our current plant has done. It's given us the ability to go a little bit longer. Another part I kind of talked about you know, when we, when we started doing more than just the street lights and we started providing service to businesses and towns, it was, uh, it was Springfield Gas uh, and Electric Forerunner Silco sued us. We went to the Supreme Court. Oliver Wendell Holmes was the presiding uh, majority opinion and said, yes, we could do that. Municipals are different. They have the interest of their community at hand. They're not out for profit. And they have the right to serve their community. So a relevant comparison, Lake Springfield, another one of Spalding's things. It was called Spalding's Folly because he started it in 1930. What happened in 1929? <laughs> really bad economic event. Huh, the Great Depression and now we've named it the Great Recession. The American Dust Bowl occurred right afterwards. The headlines in the paper said you could absorb the lake with a sponge. Anybody think the lake was a bad idea? It was built larger than the community needed. It was built for growth. It served this community for 80 years. Short-term views can distort the perception of long-term investments. Let's not judge Stallman for over the past four years. Let's have a 40-year look. This plant can produce electricity for this community at a price that no plant can be built for again. <clears throat> Lake Springfield's been here for 80 years and it was a great investment. And we had a guy that was abused in the media and by local people, wasn't supported to build it, and he had the foresight to do it. We went all the way to the Supreme Court. Do you think we would go to the Supreme Court today? It's a rhetorical question, I don't know the answer, but what, do we have the fortitude to go to the Supreme Court today? That's what our forefathers gave us in this community. Now's not the time to take a hundred year history and run from it. Let's own this place and be proud of it because it's a great place. I didn't grow up in Springfield. I got hired here in 93. I don't vote in primaries. 
I'm not a politician. I'm an electrical engineer. I went and got an MBA, and this is a great place. We have some of the best dedicated workers. The head of our power plant is a mechanical engineer with an MBA. The head of our electric T&D is an electrical engineer with an MBA. The head of our major projects is an electrical engineer with an MBA. We go to conferences with big utilities to learn something. What we find out is we have as much or more knowledge than anybody in the industry. Because we do it all. Ameren doesn't own power plants today. We do transmission. We do distribution. We do it all in this little footprint. I'm very proud of our workers, all the way down to our frontline workers. I've talked about our linemen. They get compliments. Our power plant workers, everybody. There's a lot of pride. Unfortunately, you can only take so much abuse in public before that pride begins to wane. Now, there's a lot of people looking to leave. We've lost more employees in the past five to ten years than we lost in the previous 25, I think, to competitors. It's not a good thing. So we need to think about how we treat this. You know, as I look back at this presentation and kind of wonder what I do wrong, I don't think I did it wrong, but the part that always kind of gets me is when I read media stuff, we always like to have a villain. And that villain usually has a face and a name, not the Great Recession. You know, that's when you read a headline that says, the, you know, the recessionary period still is causing financial problems. It's kind of a boring headline. We move on. We want a picture. We want a name. We want a villain. So we don't have one here because it's true. We had a perfect storm of events with a re recession. With at the same time, we built a new plant that had no idea the recession was coming. And now we've had some load decline. It's a perfect storm of events that got us here. But now's not the time to run from it. So, thank you. Very much. Stay up I sincerely want to thank Eric for joining us this morning. We've got a few minutes for some questions. Uh, may I make my typical speech? No. Okay. Ask questions, John. Anybody who's driven around Springfield in the last week could probably tell that Dalton 4 isn't running. The other two stacks should pour stuff out, but it's not. What's wrong with it now? Um, nothing's wrong with it. It's on annual outage. Um, the last time it ran, before that, it ran an entire year between scheduled outages. We take them down in the spring and the fall to do maintenance. So it's on a scheduled outage. And we, I, I think when people say, what's wrong with it now, this thing has run remarkably well. It's ran, we came in on time, we came in on budget, and it's run very well. And again, I'm not knocking Prairie State. You want to talk to those people about budget and time compared to our plant? I'm very proud of our plant. It came in on budget, and it's run great. Between scheduled outages, it had no forced outages. It's on, an, it's on a regular outage. John. Going back to the uh, options, you yep. mentioned uh, lowering rates, raising customer charge. My question is, is there a scheme for the customer charge that would be on a variable scale where a commercial user might pay a different customer charge than somebody in a two-bedroom bungalow? Yeah, you know, that, that, exists, that exists today. The larger you are, the larger the customer fixed charge is. So the largest customers have a $500 a month fixed charge. You know, the, we have a couple of accounts, the state of Illinois and a few others, so those would go up more than what an individual small house would. Those are, today, our customer charge on a house is five bucks. It's 576. So, yeah, the, it's, it already exists today. The larger the customer, the larger the fixed cost, but those would scale up also. On balance, would you say uh, the, the, the monthly charge what we proposed the larger customers go up by a lot more dollars than the small customers Bob yeah. is there a possibility that the wholesale rate for electricity could be negative at some time in the year um, 
If you want to take a snapshot in any one second in time, yes. Not any one hour, for example. Yeah, it happens. And in specific notes, this is a whole presentation of market. Um, on a yearly basis, no. You have, but that presumes energy is free and you're getting paid to take it. That happens not because of energy being free. What happens is there's congestion in the market on the transmission lines because something's happened, a transmission line's tripped, and they're redispatching generation. They're saying the generator over here is causing problems. They send negative prices to drive it down, and then the opposite end of the line is getting very positive prices. So if you're getting negative $50, the side's getting extra $50. It's a zero-sum game. So, yeah, there's, there's moments in the market very specific to points to do the congestion or prices go negative. Sir? Yes. So, uh, when you um, uh, raise rates and get enough to cover it, what percentage of uh, average bill would be, what, 10 percent, 5 percent? Um, the last time we asked for nine and a half, and we got 4.75 with some one-time cuts. If we got what we asked for last time, and then we also asked for some CPI increases, which would this year be 1.2%, we would not be in default. We would meet coverage this year. So, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're at. Now, we've changed a little bit. Rather than just ranging everything by the percent, what we're trying to do is restructure to be competitive of the industry and give the right signals. And we've seen extremely high costs in the winter for consumers and very low revenues to us because of the variable revenue. So we're trying to lower that for customer charges in the winter and our lack of sales this summer and raise the fixed costs. So we're restructuring it a little bit different, but it's not a lot different than that. Young lady at the table. A December 2013 study commissioned by CWLP at a cost of $211,000 found that closing the two older boilers at the Dalman plant would save $39 million over 20 years. At the October 7th city council meeting, you stated that closing those two boilers would cost the city um, 12 to $15 million or more. Which is it, and why do your numbers contradict the highly paid consultants' numbers? They don't contradict the consultant numbers at all. Um, the consultant took a look at the value of energy over the next 20 years and assumed pretty much no growth. And we asked him to do that because if anybody can tell us where the power markets are going, that's a crystal ball. We don't play crystal ball games. We took a conservative approach and we said, over 20 years, what's the value of those plants if the energy prices don't go up and you can continue to buy prices at what we can today? We should shut them down and we should buy off the market. Well, if anybody thinks they're going to stay at this price for the next 20 years, in the short term, this gets a little bit technical. Our whole system was built from the ground up on the 69,000 volt system. That's the lakeside plants, the original Dolmans were, and then we built a 138 system. Well, the 138 system interconnects to the Ameren systems. That's where Dalman 3 and 4 are. Majority of our loads offer 69 system. If we close 1 and 2 down, now we have no generation on a 69,000 volt system. We only have it on 138, which is the ring around the city. We now have to step all that power down. We have to buy $9 million worth of transmission uh, upgrades, transformers and other things, immediately to close those down. The Dahlman building has three plants in it. They've got great big heaters. They're called boilers. They go down, just like we talked about Dahlman 4s on a scheduled outage. Well, we always have one of those three running in the plant. If we only have one unit left, and that unit shuts down planned, like it was this past March when it was extremely cold, or forced outage, we have no building heat. We have to put building heat to keep everything from freezing. That's about a million dollars. Right now, those plants are worth about $2 million a year in revenue and capacity sales. That's just selling loads half to point to generators to say, because loads don't own generation. This gets a whole new market area, but capacity without selling any energy is about $2 million a year. And then there's energy sales. So 
Right now, it's going to cost us about $10 million to close that. What the study says is if energy prices never go up for the next 20 years, you'll get a payback. Right now, with all the plants, we're talking about 20 to 70,000 megawatts of plants are closing in the country. I don't think we can sit there and assume energy prices are going to stay at incremental costs that don't cover fixed costs. Gentleman in the red vest. Uh, two part question. You have a source of uh, coal from the Viper mine, and uh, the Viper mine might be having some difficulties depending on zoning for a uh, gob pile up north of Winsville, and that might affect your, so your source of uh, energy. And secondly, uh, do you have the capacity or is there an engineering solution to add natural gas to your coal as a uh, source of energy for the boilers? First part on Viper, um, you know, we, we contract with them because they're the lowest cost provider to us. There's mines, active mines that we've bought from before. There's other currently inactive mines. There's a lot of coal around Illinois. We chose to put in the pollution control systems that remove 99% of the SO2 so that we can continue to use local coal from local communities. Most people switch to western coal, it's called PRB, Powder River Basin, and they bring it in a train. There's all kinds of issues with that. Most people coal supplies are down to just a few days because they're having a hard time getting it in. That has 30% of the sulfur in Illinois coal, but they emit all of it because they don't have scrubbers. We remove 99%, so we're at 1% to their 30%. That's why they're going to have to close. I guess to round back, we have the ability with our plants to burn Illinois coal and be well under the EPA regs. So we, there's lots of resources in central Illinois that we could go to. They may cost a little more because naturally we buy from the lowest cost mine provider today, but there's other mines that have talked to us and want to sell to us. Your next one is on natural gas. Um, We've got, what a lot of people don't know is, anybody know we own a 120 megawatt gas turbine? Yes. We've got one. We own 120 megawatts of wind. We have a diverse portfolio. Gas turbine doesn't run much right now because even at low prices of gas, it still costs more than what the market prices are. Gas turbines are not economical today. For gas turbines to run, prices have got to go north of $50. They go north of $50, I'm not here talking today because we have great financials. But so, gas combined with coal to the cost of no. Burning gas as a fuel costs more than the coal. It's just, now what we might want to do, and what we've talked about is to keep the units operating and to get well under EPA compliance, our startup right now starts on fuel oil. You can't start right on coal, you got to start with a liquid fuel. And we start up on fuel oil, and it's diesel. Well, diesel has that black smoke, and people seen the, if you've ever seen our stacks emitting black smoke, it's diesel. It's a great big diesel semi, is what it is, starting up. And that, we can't run that through our pollution control equipment because it'll foul it. So what we want to do is start up on natural gas so that we can run the immediately, as soon as we start adding coal, it all runs right through our pollution control equipment. And that's what we've asked for is to do that. We've got to do that on Unit 3. Dalman 4 already has that. Unit 3 is our next biggest unit. We've got to do it incrementally to add it to 1 and 2 is very low cost because it will be in the building. All we have to do is change out the burner tips so we can start on gas. So we can supplement with gas. We'll be able to do some things, but incrementally it will actually add more cost because as a fuel and burning it, it's a little more expensive. Oh. Oh. Joe McMiniman, Springfield City Council. Thanks for your very informative presentation here. But a point of clarification, and I've heard this stated on the airwaves and you repeated it today. You said that uh, you asked for a 9.5% increase in rates 
two years ago, but you got four and a half percent. This is very important. Actually, isn't it accurate to say you got seven percent from the city council, but we spread it over two years, and we also gave you something which uh, this, the utility did not ask for. We raised the consumer charges, which was not asked for, which is now I think you agree that's a good idea. And also, but we did deny something that you asked for, which was perpetual rate increases, because the utility's original plan was to have a built-in cost of living rate increase every year for, forever, and that's something the city council declined. So I just would ask you to clarify what that rate increase was all about two years ago. What we asked for, we asked for CPI in the future, but it wasn't in perpetuity. It had a cutoff. It said once wholesale sales reached a certain level, they would end. So that was what we asked for, which, yeah, we got 4.75 and then we got a 2% the next year. That's what we asked for. We asked for a CPI increase the next year. So to me, that nets out what we asked for. And then we asked for additional ones. There was a 1.2% increase that would be this year. So that's what we asked for were, you know, ongoing incremental charges. We worked with the uh, Chamber of Commerce on developer costs because the way we did it, people didn't like it. We talked to them, we talked to the business community, we talked to developers. That's what people wanted, was a CPI. We've, we've gone out and put in costs. How do we cost subdivisions? We have a flat rate per lot and per linear foot of road, and those go up by CPI every year. And that's what people said they want. They want that rather than waiting 10 years and coming and asking for a huge rate increase. What CPI represent? That's the cost of the basket of our goods. Went up every year. It's gone up by 1.2%. And so that's, people are used to absorbing that. What's hard is to come wait 10 years and then come ask for 18%. So Gentlemen, that's, in, I'm sorry, in the bleachers. There are a lot of people think natural gas is the answer to generation problems. How much natural gas was available at the interstate turbine during the polar vortex last winter? Anybody know that question, know the answer to that? Zero. There was no gas available for our interstate turbine during the coldest days. We called, the markets called and said, we need your gas turbine because we're short of energy. Our panhandle pipeline said there is zero available at any price. The prices before that were triple and quadruple what they were the day before, but there was zero available because every bit of gas was going to heating. That's, we've seen this once before. We built the gas turbine in the 90s. So did everybody else because gas was cheap back then, around three and a half dollars a decatherm, kind of where it's at now. And all of a sudden the industry said, that's the savior. Let's go build gas plants. Anywhere a gas line and a transmission line cross, there's a gas plant underneath it. And what happened to gas prices in the late 90s? Anybody know? They went to over $10 a decatherm. Why? because we as an industry were eating it all up with gas turbines. One great big gas turbine burns as much gas as thousands of homes. We used it all summer when naturally was going into storage to keep the price of gas lower on residential consumers in the winter. We, we ate it all up in the summer. We drove the gas prices to $10 a decatherm. Guess what that did to people's heating bills? So. Today, people don't compete for coal to heat their houses. We're going to, as an industry that we have to deliver electricity at any price because our consumers demand it. We are going to outcompete every day the poor residential consumer trying to buy gas to heat their house. We are going to drive their prices through the roof. One more, lady in the black. Go ahead. Um, we had a question about um, some research we've done. We found that there are other municipal utilities in the Midwest that are starting to close coal, pan coal plants and investing in clean energy, and they've seen huge savings to the taxpayers in um, Nebraska, Missouri, and four different communities. Given that these other municipal utilities are seeing the economic sense of, you know, uh, bringing even more diversity to their energy mix, um, I know you've mentioned some wind in the presentation and that CDBLP has diversity. Um, are you looking at maybe bringing even more diversity to the situation? We are at 20% today. Do you know what the state RPS is today? The Renewable Portfolio Standard for the rest of people in Illinois? It's in single digits. They don't get 20% until 2022. 
we, we lead, not only Illinois, the country, all right? The other people that are closing those plants down is because they did not invest in pollution control equipment. And there's no money to invest $100 million worth of pollution control today off those plants. We have debt service as this community we're still paying on, on our investments. We have installed all this in our existing plants. And I guess I got a question back to you. Let's say we close these two down and it represents 100 megawatts of load. What's the right amount of wind to buy to replace that? Uh, well, there's actually something else that we were... No, I, 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 gotta, I would like to know. Anybody know? What's the right amount to replace 100 megawatts of wind? Well, I actually have... You know, this is, this is a presentation. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this morning. I really want to thank Eric for being with us. Thank you very, very much.